It's Time to Shine a Light on Female Domestic Violence by Nicholas Martin, published in Medium, June 20, 2020. Read by the author. In the 1970s, when I ran for mayor of Lexington, Kentucky, I focused on domestic violence against women, which was then almost taboo to discuss publicly. I advocated the creation of a women's center to help victims. Now I want to break the taboo against discussing domestic violence against men, about which I have many years' personal experience. I don't seek sympathy or to minimize violence against women, but to give encouragement to the ignored male victims of violence and to illuminate how they are treated by the justice system. I was in an abusive relationship for 27 years. As is typically the case, I experienced a combination of emotional and physical aggression. It was about insecurity and control. My partner lashed out when she was jealous or feeling helpless. I felt a lot more pity for her than anger until she began habitually degrading me in front of our child. I always felt I could manage the hostility and violence until it was directed at my fatherhood. My spouse's anger was almost daily, her violence quite common. So close to it, I was less able to analyze it than to experience it. The first time we went out after becoming acquainted, she became livid because I spoke pleasantly, not flirtatiously, to a waitress. Early on, she bought a book about coping with jealousy without benefit. Many times I had no exact idea what precipitated her episodes of explosive rage. I literally rolled with the punches. I was able to either duck or fend off most of her punches, and she would often swing so wildly that she hit walls and furniture, leaving her fingers scraped and swollen. The one time she connected with a fist to the nose and kicks to my legs, We were on full display in front of a packed restaurant. During none of her attacks did I hit back. One time, in a frantic rage, she drove off in her car and slammed into another vehicle. During severe episodes, I called 911 four times in three cities, and the results were what many men have experienced or suspected would happen. She would admit to having struck me, explain why she was justified in doing it, and the officers did nothing. In one instance, I pleaded with them to tell her not to engage in violence. I called the police on the way home after the restaurant beating, and when two officers arrived, one simply asked, Where is she? And I let them in to speak to her while I waited in another room. They soon left without even bothering to speak to me, with my swollen nose, before leaving. My worst experience with law enforcement was in Indianapolis. Minutes after I called 911, two sheriff's deputies arrived and the female deputy was immediately confrontational, demanding that I produce identification in my own home. The same was not demanded of my violent spouse. When I tried to speak, the deputy moved towards me menacingly and instructed me loudly to shut up. My ex was given time to vent while I, the victim, was given another lesson in what many men know, that the man is the presumptive perpetrator. I found it frightening. As our child grew, my spouse's violence was replaced by vulgar degradation. This was far more effective and painful as I could do nothing to protect myself. It had profoundly negative and permanent impact on my parenting. I'm gratified that there is now widespread awareness about domestic violence against women, but disappointed that partner violence against men is still minimized. Research has shown that violence by women is at least as common as by men. A large 2007 study found that half of violent relationships were reciprocally violent, but in non-reciprocally violent relationships, women are the perpetrators in more than 70% of the cases. Experts in domestic violence have noted that among large population samples, 57.9% of violence was bidirectional, 42% unidirectional. Of one-way violence, 13.8% was male to female, 
and 28.3% was female to male. It starts young, with similar percentages of male and female high school and college students being victimized by relationship violence. In 2000, psychology professor John Archer was president of the International Society for Research on Aggression. In a survey of partner violence data from the U.S. and U.K., Archer found that more women than men perpetrate relationship violence. Insufficient research has explored the extent of intimate relationship violence by females. Not until 2013 were men asked in the Federal National Crime Victimization Survey whether they had experienced rape or sexual violence. The surprising result was that 38% of men reported being victims of such crimes and 46% of the reported perpetrators were female. A 2010 survey of available research by psychotherapist Ronnie Weisberg-Ross found that there is an alarmingly high rate of sexual abuse by females in the backgrounds of rapists, sex offenders, and sexually aggressive men. For over a year, starting when I was 15, I was sexually exploited by a faculty wife at one of America's elite boarding high schools. When men are victims of sexual violence, they find few places to turn for immediate help. Dr. Denise Hines, a leading researcher into intimate partner violence, surveyed men who had been victims. 64% of the men who called domestic violence hotlines were told that the services only assisted women. Only 8% of the men said a hotline was very helpful, and 16% said the hotline dismissed or made fun of them. The media still minimize male victimization by repeating dubious statistics. For instance, a 2017 news story by NPR begins by noting that just one in seven men has suffered partner violence, ignoring Professor Emily Douglas's assertion to the NPR reporter that men and women use violence at roughly the same rates. Rarely does a domestic violence shelter, such as I advocated for women in the 1970s, provide assistance to battered men. All partner violence is unacceptable. Violence and abuse devastated my life, and law enforcement was no help. When women spoke out, consciousness was raised about violence they experienced. Now men need to do the same thing and to be taken seriously. Nicholas Martin, director of the Consumer Health Education Council, is writing a book about his experience as a father.